on Unsolved Mysteries. A rock star turned computer whiz alone in his car on the freeway. A desperate call to 911, and then nothing. The man and his vehicle literally vanish into thin air. What happened to Taylor Kramer? Voodoo. The very word conjures up images of black magic, hexes, and curses. But believers insist voodoo can be a force for good. Just wait until you see the incredible story of two doctors in Texas who turned to voodoo to cure a dying man. Recently, this man lost custody of his children after a bitter court battle. Now police believe he is a killer. The victim was his ex-wife's attorney. How do you treat an arthritic tiger with an attitude? Perhaps you can call on Linda Tellington Jones, a therapist with an unorthodox approach and an unconventional client list. Join me. Perhaps you hold the one vital clue that will help solve one of tonight's unsolved mysteries. That call to a 911 operator in Los Angeles marks a moment this man, Philip Taylor Kramer, vanished. The question is, did he commit suicide? And if he did, why have so many people seen him? In a God of a Frida, honey, don't you know that I love you? In the 1970s, Taylor Kramer was a bass player for the rock and roll band Iron Butterfly. By the 90s, Taylor had settled down and become a family man. Taylor and his wife Jennifer have two young children, a boy and a girl. Taylor Kramer is also a math and computer whiz who founded his own high-tech multimedia company in 1990. For several weeks before his disappearance, he had been working around the clock on an exciting new breakthrough. What time is it? He said, it's very simple. It's been here the whole time. It's so simple that no one has discovered it. I can't believe how close I am right now. And he said, imagine Jennifer, a computer and a camera, being able to find a missing child in a sea of thousands of people by just showing the computer a small piece of that child's face and finding that child in a fraction of a second. Taylor's research consumed him. It was based on revolutionary theories about data compression, ideas that his father, a former professor of electrical engineering, had developed 30 years earlier. My brother was just so excited in the fact that they had made this beautiful discovery that was going to help people. And I believe, in fact, that, 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 that that's real. But my brother, just being the person that he is, the excitement of it all and everything just uh, uh, overwhelmed him. Sweetheart, the hand hey. of God has touched me. Taylor, calm down. You're going to twist an ankle. I can do ankle. no wrong. <laughs> He's sending me the truth, babe. The day before he disappeared, we went on a hike up in Thousand Oaks. And we hiked up to the top of a hill and we look across, and you can see the whole um, Conejo Valley where we live, and there's a cross up on the hill that belongs to one of the colleges nearby. And he turned around, and he pointed to the cross, and he said, look, honey, our house is right in the path of this cross. He started to see sacredness in everything. Jennifer now blames Taylor's bizarre behavior on sleep deprivation. Like I said, they're coming in the day after the hike, Taylor left home around 9 a.m. He would visit his father-in-law briefly, 
and go to the airport to pick up a business associate and his wife. Taylor went to the airport as scheduled, waited 25 minutes, then inexplicably left before his friends arrived. He drove north toward his home. Along the way, he made a series of phone calls. At one point, he left a message for his old friend, Ron Bushy, the drummer for Iron Butterfly. Bushy, this is Kramer. I love you more than life itself. His voice sounded stressed. Um, he sounded maybe like scared. Maybe he'd even been crying, I don't know. But apparently this cell phone call from his car was made to me. Um, and he also called Jennifer and a lot of other people. Hi, Jay. Listen, uh, you tell Greg, tell Greg I'm not gonna be able to meet him at the airport. He'll understand, okay? And I said, Taylor, where are you? Where are you going? What are you doing? Sweetheart, I want you to remember that whatever happens, I'll always be with you. And I started to get scared, and I thought, something is wrong with Taylor. And I said, where are you going? You just tell him that uh, I'll meet him at the hotel at 1, OK? And, and really calmly and lovingly, like he normally talks to me, he said, and when I see you, honey, I have a big surprise for you. But I knew in my gut that Taylor wasn't going to be at the hotel. I, I just knew that he wouldn't be there. An hour later, Taylor made his last contact, a call to 911. Hello, can I help you? Yes, you can. I'm going to kill myself. OK, what is your name? Hello? Hello? It's really hard to commit suicide and uh, take your life and, and disappear. I mean, somebody's going to find you. Somebody's going to find the car. And, and the, the car and him were gone. No car, no body. No further activity on Taylor's credit cards or cellular phone. However, after his family papered the Los Angeles area with posters, several people claimed they had seen Taylor Kramer near the area where he made his phone calls. A pawn shop employee in Canoga Park, California, spotted Taylor in late February. When he was here that day, um, he left an impression on me. And then when Chuck came in and showed me the picture, I was positive that it was him because we stayed here and talked for a little while. So, I mean, I couldn't, couldn't be wrong about it. That's why I'm 100% sure that it was him. Around the same time, Jan Biondi and her daughter saw Taylor at a garage sale. Then later that day, Kathy came by in the car and passing out the flyers and said, you know, he likes garage sales, he's been seen in this area, have you seen him? And my daughter said, yeah, 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 he was here this morning. If Taylor Kramer did not commit suicide, what happened to him? On February 28th, 1995, two and a half weeks after his disappearance, Jennifer believes he made one final call to his family. He called the house and the answer machine picked up and all Taylor said was, hello? Hello. In a moment, an unexpected conclusion in the case of a missing husband. Recently, we brought you a missing persons case that was perhaps one of the most unusual we have ever presented. Now the case is solved, and the outcome has proven to be just as odd as the story itself. Can you hear witnesses? In 1990, Christine Reinhardt finally found the man of her dreams. She and Craig Williamson were married just a month after they met. Can you kiss your wife? The newlyweds were virtually inseparable. They bought a farm in Wisconsin and began to raise exotic fish for sale to gourmet restaurants. But in 1993, Christine Reinhardt's perfect world was torn apart. That August, Craig drove to Colorado Springs, Colorado on a business trip and never returned. Craig's disappearance launched Christine on a heartbreaking 18-month search. She traveled to Colorado Springs, 
posted flyers, asked questions. She went to the hotel where Craig was last seen. Every lead came to a dead end, but Christine refused to give up hope. I know he's alive, and I know someday I'll find him. The trouble is I don't know when, and I just have to keep hanging on. The hardest part is hanging on. Shortly after our broadcast, Christine Reinhardt's long odyssey finally came to an end. However, it was a far cry from the joyous conclusion she had hoped for. Here's Keely Shea Smith with the details. After seeing himself on our program, Craig Williamson phoned Christine from Key West, Florida, where he was working as a handyman. Craig was now going by the name of Ron, and he bore little resemblance to the loving husband Christine remembered. The phone rang, and he said, hello, Christine, this is Craig. And it didn't really sound like him. He sounded like a shell of himself. It, 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 from what phrases he used and things like that, I knew it was Craig. But his voice was really, oh, very weak. And, uh, and I was just shaking. I was, I was in total shock. Craig Williamson recounted a harrowing tale. All he could remember was that he had been attacked by an unknown assailant in Colorado Springs. What followed were two years of severe amnesia, painful headaches, and frequent blackouts. Two years with virtually no sense of who he was. When I saw this whole thing on Unsolved Mysteries, I realized that I was Craig Williamson, but I didn't know who Craig Williamson was. I didn't have a clue to who he was. I knew that he had a family someplace. Um, I knew that he was married. I didn't know that he had a fish farm. I didn't know a lot. Last September, Craig and Christine met in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Christine hoped that a tour of the area where Craig had disappeared might help to jog his memory. Does that look at all familiar to you? It doesn't. It doesn't. It looks familiar from the unsolved mystery segment, but nothing. It doesn't. I've, there's nothing here. I feel nothing. No attachment to it. So no, it doesn't. Except In the you. end, Craig remembered nothing, and the reunion Christine had long dreamed of ended in a bittersweet parting. Neither Craig nor I are the same people we were two years ago before all of this happened. We're still very good friends, and we're always going to stay connected, but we can't go back. He's not there. He doesn't have any sort of emotional attachment anymore, and I just have to accept that. We are not the same people. We still love each other and we still care for each other, but we've decided it's best for us to go our separate ways and still be friends and we still love each other, but, but we're not the same people that married. Take care of yourself. Everything I've done has been worth it. The search, all the effort that I've put into trying to find Craig was worth it. I would do it all over again and I can't imagine doing it any other way. Craig Williamson is now living with friends in California, hopefully receiving the medical treatment he needs. Christine has moved to Wyoming to begin life anew. In a moment, two doctors, a desperately ill patient, and a journey into the shadowy world of voodoo. Tonight, four innocent people are in hiding, worried that they may be the next victim of an alleged killer named Kelly McGinnis, all the result of a custody battle that began in bitterness and apparently ended in murder. It happened just one month ago yesterday, August 12, 1996. Thomas Meyer, the city attorney of Greenville, Illinois, was found shot to death in the alley behind his office. One of the first to respond to the scene was John King, Greenville's chief of police. Thomas Meyer was his best friend. It was one glance and I knew that it was him and uh, there was no life left. 67-year-old Thomas Meyer had suffered multiple gunshot wounds. There were no witnesses to the shooting, but fingers were pointing at Kelly McGinnis from the start. McGinnis and Meyer had recently clashed in this courtroom. Meyer had represented McGinnis's ex-wife in a legal action regarding the custody of their two young children. Kelly McGinnis felt that the children uh, would be better off with him. He desperately wanted to be the custodial parent. 
but the result was that uh, Mrs. McGinnis was awarded custody, and Mr. McGinnis was awarded uh, uh, some visitation, uh, a fair amount of visitation. McGinnis apparently refused to accept the decision as final. Just hours before the murder of Thomas Meyer, McGinnis was back in the courthouse, reportedly still angry about being denied custody. No one knows what was going through his mind, but he was next seen near the alley where Thomas Meyer was shot dead. We have witnesses that put Mr. McGinnis at the scene just prior to the shooting, and Mr. McGinnis was seen leaving the area shortly after the time of the murder. When police went to McGinnis's home to question him, no one answered the door. When they broke it down, McGinnis had vanished. A day went by, a week. Some speculated that McGinnis had taken his own life. Then 10 days after the murder, McGinnis mailed five letters from central Illinois. Two went to area newspapers and complained about corruption in the judicial process. He wrote in part, clearly the only winner in a divorce case are the lawyers, their gains being made at the expense of the children. The other three letters went to relatives and a friend in one of them. The letter was very apologetic to his family. Uh, although it wasn't an admission of the offense, it alluded to that. He appears to be very sorry for what happened. He, he makes mention of the fact that uh, he will probably never see his children again, and, he, and he's very remorseful for that. The killing has shattered Greenville's sense of security. Murders just don't happen here. The last one was 10 years ago. Now some fear the killing hasn't stopped. McGinnis's ex-wife has left town with her children. Their whereabouts a secret. McGinnis's own attorney is under the protection of U.S. Marshals. Guards have beefed up security at the courthouse, and Ann Callis Ranji, the judge who ruled on McGinnis's custody suit, has gone into hiding. Judge Ranji is very concerned for her safety. She's expressed that to us. Uh, also, I've spoken on a daily basis with her family members. Uh, she just wants him caught. But no one wants McGinnis caught more than Thomas Meyer's widow, Barbara. I just pray that he will come forward without hurting anyone else. The McGinnis family, I'm sure, is suffering as much as we are. His parents, his siblings, his children, his ex-wife, you know, we need some healing for everybody. When we return, meet Linda Tellington Jones. Can her mysterious healing touch soothe a savage beast? If you are a person and you are in pain, you can find a specialist somewhere to treat you no matter what the problem. But what if you're not a person? In the animal kingdom, Linda Tellington Jones is a one-woman Mayo Clinic. She uses her own special healing technique she calls the tea touch The results are phenomenal, truly an unsolved mystery. Keiko the killer whale won hearts around the world when he escaped to the open sea in the film Free Willy. In real life, Keiko suffers from a troublesome papilloma a strange wart-like growth beneath his pectoral fins. During the 10 years Keiko has lived at Adventure Kingdom in Mexico City, no one has been able to cure it. Enter Linda Tellington Jones. When I was asked to work with Keiko with the touches, I really didn't know if it would help him or not. What I was hoping is that these little circular touches would actually affect the cells and help to reduce the effects of this virus-like papilloma. Keiko's handlers were amazed to see results almost immediately. The day after Linda was with Keiko, um, we, we saw big changes on the papilloma. 
um, it was very thin and it, it wasn't broken as always is. So he was active also, he was like kind of very happy. Linda Tellington Jones claims she has helped thousands of animals during the 20 years since she developed her tea touch. However, there are skeptics who suggest that Linda's touch is no more than a pleasant massage. To get a first-hand look at this mystery, we went to Out of Africa, a wild animal park in Phoenix, Arizona. Janine Ford, an anchor woman with KPNX TV, our NBC affiliate in Phoenix, joins us from the park. The Out of Africa Wildlife Park showcases hundreds of different kinds of exotic animals from all over the world. And while the handlers here can take care of most of the behavioral issues, these are wild animals and there are some problem cases. For instance, this 400-pound Siberian tiger named Brendel has been known to unexpectedly charge her fence, scaring visitors and creating problems for her handlers. At first, she seemed open to Linda, but in an instant, the encounter turned ugly. Linda had even less success with Cheddar, a temperamental African caracal whose paws may have nerve damage. Fortunately, Cheddar, unlike the other cats, had been declawed and Linda was not hurt. Undaunted, she went on to bigger game. Kipling, a 400-pound Bengal tiger, has joints that are inflamed and very painful. Perhaps the T-Touch can help him. But what exactly is the T-Touch? They're a collection of circular touches done all over the body with the idea, with the intent of waking up the functioning of the cells. To make the connection, I did the big circles and say, feel you, feel you. And then when I really went into the joints, it's this very directed connection so that he really feels the intent of waking up those cells. It's like turning on the electric lights of the body. It seemed to calm him down and his body relaxed and his breathing came heavier. Um, so he was going into a, a deep, uh, relaxed state by her touch. When she got to a point where it was obvious he, his joints hurt him, he reacted but not violently in any way. So now we know where to touch and where he really needs it just from, from what she did with that, that session with him. Linda now faced her biggest challenge, Genesis. Another Siberian tiger doesn't have an off button. He is prone to attack almost anyone, even on occasion, handlers he's known all his life. He has attacked me. I have a personal experience with Genesis where he actually went through my arm and uh, way into my arm. I'm hoping that with Linda's touch that we'll be able to work with him because he needs touch. He very much wants to be handled and yet he's so dangerous. So I'm hoping that I will be able to be in there with him without getting hurt. It was too risky for Linda to go inside the tiger's enclosure. From outside, Linda guided Bobby in performing the tea touch while another handler, Shay Erickson, kept Genesis pacified by letting him lick her fingers. Now go back toward the shoulders. Um, if there's a way you can keep him sucking and you reach back and if you can yet get to the neck and shoulders and at least give him a little bit of relief on the shoulders because, of course, when he's protecting his when he's putting so much in the first session, Genesis remained wary and alert, but relaxed enough to stretch out on his side. The primary contact with the hand where he feels safe up on the shoulder, and the other one just kind of moves back. And up there along the top of the scalp where the right hand is, that's where it gets, kind of gets sore. What we find is that the touches override fear or aggression. Those are instinctive responses, and that when we do these little circular touches all over the body, you can take an animal who is very fearful or an animal who is aggressive and suddenly you change them at a core level, at the level of the brain. 
A few hours later, they tried a second session. Shay again gentled the tiger by letting him lick her fingers, while Bobby continued to apply the Tellington touch. Different spot. Work with your left hand around the shoulders, just like you are, and slowly go back down his back. A few minutes later, Shay took away the pacifier. Yeah. I got very nervous because I knew at that moment he didn't have the same distraction that he had before, and so there was a moment of hesitation. I put my hand by his mouth, wondering what was going to go on, but his response was wonderful. He knew I was there, it was okay, and he was enjoying being touched. As a skeptic, you know, I don't, I don't understand part of her philosophy of relaxing and getting to cellular levels. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me from a medical standpoint, but... Dr. Irvin Ingram, a Phoenix veterinarian, and has again, treated Genesis world. several times. He approached the T-Touch sessions with reservations. By the end of the day, Dr. Ingram saw a distinct change in the tiger. Something certainly made a difference, and she's the primary difference, I guess, today, but there's no question from this morning to this afternoon, much calmer. Seems almost aware of what's around him instead of being in his own little world. But you're still skeptical over the whole I don't understand, and, um, and certainly I need more than one episode to be convinced, but it's a miraculous change on this individual case, yeah. I couldn't ask for better results than what we got from Genesis. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, to be able to be in there with him and not experience that fear I had before with that touch being the go-between, if you will. How does the touch work? <laughs> I wish I knew. I don't know how the touch, I mean, I don't know why it works. I don't really know how it works. We only know from experience in six continents with incredible numbers of animals and people that it does work, but it's a mystery. According to Linda Tellington Jones, anyone can learn the T-Touch. Perhaps in the future, a visit to the doctor won't mean a shot, but a gentle touch. And how are Linda's tiger patients doing? Much better. Particularly Genesis, who is now literally acting like a pussycat. When we return, two doctors, a desperately ill patient, and a journey into the shadowy world of voodoo. For most of us, the word brings to mind images of death hexes and evil curses, blood, pain, agony. But believers say that is black magic. Voodoo is something altogether different. Ava K. Jones is a priestess of voodoo in New Orleans, Louisiana. She insists that voodoo is a force for good, not evil. It is, in fact, an ancient nature-based religion that traces its origins back thousands of years to West Africa. A lot of people come to me who somehow seem uh, to be fixed in negative emotions, negative ways of thinking. Some of them are, in fact, hexed. But are hexes and incantations real? Can voodoo affect someone on the physical level? Or is it all in the minds of those who believe? There is truly a psychological component to voodoo. And by that I mean certainly if you want to be healed, and if you believe that you will be healed, your state of mind has a direct effect on your healing. Faith works miracles. That idea is common to all religions. And now science is beginning to accept that the power of belief can indeed cure, whether it's the healing waters of Lourdes or the arcane rituals of voodoo. In the story you're about to see, two doctors create their own voodoo ceremony. It's a daring last-ditch attempt to save a dying man. It may defy all you know about medical treatment, but those involved swear every detail is true. Mr. In 1967, Dr. Larry Dossie was a young intern at a hospital in Texas. Weight, right? 
One afternoon, he was assigned a new patient, a man we will call Harold. Harold was as weak and emaciated as a prisoner of war. Any pain anywhere? Not really. Sometimes when I cough. Okay. Well, we're going to run some tests. We're going to do some blood tests and some x-rays, that sort of thing. We're going to find out what your problem is, okay? Thank you. I embarked on a, an elaborate evaluation, a medical workup to uncover the cause of the problem. And this man's chart just began to get thicker and thicker with normal tests. Mr. Bennett, I don't understand it. I've run every test I know how, I've performed every exam I know how, and they all come up normal. How do you feel? Not good at all, Doc. You don't, you don't look good. I just don't know what to do. A baffled Dr. Dossie called in another intern, Dr. William Hensley, for a second opinion. I've been really worried about you. And I wanted to come see you to find out possibly if anything that you know of unusual has happened to you, such as an insect bite or anything of that sort. Doctor, do you believe in hoodoo? Dr. Hensley was stunned by the question. It took him back some 20 years to his grandmother's sprawling South Texas ranch. A woman named Mary, reputed to be a voodoo queen, lived out back. As a small child, Dr. Hensley witnessed Mary's power firsthand when a young woman was assaulted by one of the ranch workers. When the constable came to arrest him, uh, my grandmother refused to let that happen and had him sent back to the back of the place. And Mary, who was the head person in the back, said that she had put a death hex on him. And sure enough, that night, there was all kinds of clattering going on and a fire at the back of the place. And, and this went on every night for several nights. And then one day, Mary came to the back door and said, uh, Juan's dead. And they came and picked him up. And my uncle, who was a physician, said there wasn't a mark on him. A while back, I went to see a reader. I was having some problems. Harold confided to Dr. Hensley that he had refused to pay a fortune teller who had given him a reading. She apparently cursed Harold with a death hex. I started feeling bad, feeling real bad. You really believe this? I believe she put a dying hex on me, doctor. There really was a possibility that someone with, with that strong a belief system could actually be frightened to death. Larry, I just met with Harold. Yeah? You're not going to believe what he told me. What? Let's go talk over here. You know, I consider myself a fairly thorough physician, but yet I was blind to the possibility that anything like a hexing or a cursing had taken place. So this just didn't have a place in the way I thought the world worked. But Dr. Hensley's worldview was different, in fact, radically different. What kind of procedure? We could take a fingernail of his or some hair and burn it. Well, I don't know. That sounds pretty far out. Well, the thing is, if we let Dr. Hensley felt there was only one way to cure Harold. He wanted to use the voodoo techniques he had learned as a child to drive out the evil spirits. I was confronted with something, for me, that was very, very strange. Uh, I realized, though, that we'd better do something uh, because this man was dying. We were fearful, and we were convinced at the time that we could be severely reprimanded if not fired. Therefore, we did this at the slow time of the week, which was late Saturday night, so no one would witness this ceremony, this dehexing ritual. I knew that there had to be a fire. Uh, I knew that we had to have a body part. Uh, and I knew that we had to convince him that we were superior and could overcome the, uh, the hex that had been put on him. Whether by accident or fate, it was a full moon night. The doctors needed fire. They lit a drug called mandelamine. It burned with an eerie flame. This magic is more powerful than any that has come before it. They needed a lock of hair. And finally, the incantation. As your hair burns, the hex is removed. Harold, if you breathe word of this to anyone, the hex will return twofold. How 
are you doing? Good morning. I got something for you. Oh, oh and let me get this. The next morning, to everyone's amazement, Harold was alert and full of life. Can I have some ham and eggs, too? Sure, that's what you want? Yeah. OK, I'll go get it. Thank you. Harold. Hi, doctor. Hi, how are you feeling today? Much, much, much better. Yeah, it looks like your appetite's back, huh? It was genuine. It was a cure. Overnight, literally overnight, this man turned the corner uh, from death into life. This was your basic dramatic uh, miracle kind of cure. I don't believe that anything medically cured him. Uh, and I don't know what did. I, I know that, that uh, he believed so strongly uh, in, in both uh, what was happening to him and what we were doing to change what, it, what was happening to him, that uh, we were able to prevail. There are a lot of people who are lay people, who are excellent mediums, who are not um, necessarily in the priesthood, who know how to deal with spirit forces and forms. And Dr. Hensley did have a background in, because of his childhood in dealing with um, magic. This magic is more powerful than any... Does voodoo truly work? Or was Harold's illness and his swift recovery brought on entirely by his own imagination? The hex is removed. In order to understand why this man lived, we have to understand that belief is biology. Your belief becomes your biology. There's not the mind here and the body over here. They're not separate. So if you wanted to cure this man, you need not just work on the body. You could work with the belief system. This is what all shamans do. This is what Dr. Hensley did. No matter what you may believe about voodoo, there is no doubt that the mind can be one of medicine's most powerful tools. Though Harold's doctors never again prescribed voodoo, they have always remained open to alternative forms of healing. Stay tuned. Perhaps you can help locate a young man who has no idea that he has inherited more than $50,000. Over the years, we have found that every missing person's case has its own unique twist. Tonight, with your help, we hope to reunite a family and in the process find the long-lost heir to a $50,000 estate. Like any teenager, 19-year-old Tim Monar of Daytona Beach, Florida had his moves. But by all accounts, they gave no hint of what would happen on January 24, 1984. Tim, a student in aeronautical mechanics, simply drove away from home and out of his family's life. Tim was a rather quiet, uh, sensitive type of a person. But he was always very polite and well-mannered, and he was doing well in school, was on the dean's list, in fact. And uh, he was a very likable person. I'm really getting worried. He's always so prompt. Well, why don't you give Billy a Tim's call? parents grew increasingly frightened as the hours passed, and Tim failed to come home. Frank, did he act kind of strangely when he dropped, dropped you off at school? Or did His 14-year-old brother, Frank, had been the last family member to see him. Have a nice day. Okay. Um, there was a pretty good age difference between us, but we still hung out a lot, because, you know, we got along real good and pretty open relationship, and uh, I could just tell something was, something was bothering him. Why he wasn't really saying, it seemed like there was a lot going on in his mind. Two weeks passed, no word from Tim. The Molnar's first clue came from a gas station in Lake City, Florida, 150 miles north. On the day he disappeared, Tim had stopped there and paid for a tank of gas with his parents' credit card. Do you remember seeing him, possibly? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember the car. You Great do? car. You do? Yeah. Oh. Dutch Dart. The attendant recalled that Tim had been traveling alone, but traveling where? anything wrong? Tim's family could only guess. Then they received a letter from an auto impound company in Georgia. That is Tim's tire. 
The Molnars learned that six days after Tim vanished, his car had been abandoned in a parking lot, one block from Atlanta's Greyhound bus terminal. When we went to inspect the car, we did find his driver's license and wallet and um, some identification and our credit card, which indicated to me that he changed his identity. And in other words, he wanted to start a new life from there on. One fact was undeniable. It's empty. Someone had carefully removed everything of value from the car. A new stereo, Tim's expensive tool set, and a 10-speed bike he had packed in the trunk were all missing. Had Tim Molnar sold his possessions to buy a one-way bus ticket to a new life? Or was the explanation perhaps more sinister? I worried mostly about foul play and was afraid that something happened to him because we have no proof that he drove his car from Lake City, Florida, to Atlanta. Tim Molnar left behind a tangle of conflicting clues. On one hand, he didn't take any clothes with him. Perhaps he had never really intended to stay away. And yet, just before leaving, Tim had withdrawn nearly all the money from his savings account. He did, however, leave a balance of $10, as though to say he might someday return. I mean, no matter where he is or what he's up to, it'd be great to see him and just, you know, tell him we miss him and, um, you know, kind of curious why he left, what have you, I'm sure. You know, I don't know what the circumstances were, but, uh, you know, it'd be great to see him. Join me two weeks from tonight for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries.